Um, it's so nice to meet you all virtually. Um, so just a little bit about myself. My name is Natty Abrams, as you can see on my little Zoom box. Um, I, I'll start from the beginning. So I have known I wanted to be a doctor for basically all my life. Um, I grew up in New York City. I went to high school in New York City. Um, I actually, the first experience that I really had sort of clinically was shadowing neurosurgeons when I was, I think, probably in ninth or 10th grade. Um, I was actually at the hospital where um, Dr. Bookfar and Dr. Langer used to work. Um, and I shadowed Dr. Bookfar for maybe one or two times. He doesn't remember it, but I did. Um, I then went on to college at Duke University. Um, shout out to any Dukies that are in here right now. Um, I was pre-med in college. I um, ma majored in evolutionary anthropology and I minored in chemistry and psychology. Um, so a little bit of everything and not like the typical, you know, pre-med, bio, neuroscience, um, go Blue Devils, um, hey Michelle. Um, and I graduated, I actually took two years off. So I know you guys heard from Brandon last week and I remember him saying that he went straight. I took two gap years, which if that's something you're interested in, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, for me, it made absolute sense. I wanted for, I wanted my four years of college to just kind of be smooth that I didn't want to have to cram anything in. Um, I took one, no more than one science course for each semester, um, including two summer sessions. So I was able to focus on just one pre-med course at a time. And then I took two years off at the end just to kind of you know, gather my bearings a little bit. Um, I worked as a scribe in an ER through the company Scribe America. It was the most incredible experience. Um, for anyone looking for a gap year job, I really recommend doing that. You get tremendous amounts of clinical exposure, direct clinical exposure. You're not just shadowing, but you're actually working. Um, and I was in an ER and that was great. Um, and then I applied to med school and you know, I'm a little bit further removed from these other two panelists. I'm actually a MS4 now. Um, so I can definitely give you some tips and tricks for application process, but as I said, I'm a little further removed from the other ones. Um, but so yeah, I, I go to Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. I absolutely love it. I started, I guess, in 2018, and I just started my first year of, or my first month of fourth year. Um, so I just finished my clinical rotations. If you guys have any questions about that, I am happy to speak about it. It was the best year of my entire life. One of the hardest years, but one of the best years. Um, and I am um, applying now for residency. So just one more thing, and then I'll stop talking to give the other people an opportunity to speak. But um, during the summer between my first and second year, a lot of people do research. And I actually did research in neurosurgery with Dr. Bookfar. Um, I reached out to him, I wrote him an email, and I was like, hey, you definitely don't remember me, but um, I shadowed you when I was in like ninth grade. And any chance that I could do research with you. So I spent the summer working with the neurosurgery department at Lenox, and that's kind of why I'm here. I still am, you know, very tight with the with the group, and um, I still help out, kind of writing every now and then. I'm not doing um, neurosurgery for my specialty. For whoever just asked, I am applying into internal medicine actually, um, with the hopes of being, as of now, a cardiologist or a critical care specialist. But TBD. Um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I'm currently um, studying for step two. So that's kind of my life right now. Um, but yeah, so anyways, uh, I'll let everyone speak. And then I guess what we'll do is we'll kind of go through some questions after everyone gives in a little introduction. Maddie, right. thank you so much for that. If you're able to stay, you, can, you should stay on for the 10 yeah. and 11 lectures because they're two like incredible cardiologists so, <laughs> who are also women, so. Oh, Dr. Rosen and Dr. Nurul, I've heard that they're like amazing. So for you guys, like they're for women physicians, for future cardiologists, for really anyone, they're both so inspirational. So it's going to be, those two talks are going to be awesome. Thank you so much, Maddie. All right. Um, I can go. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shazeb Salim. I'm a current first year at the Zucker School of Medicine. Um, I was actually born um, abroad. I was born in Pakistan in June 1997. Um, my family, my parents and I moved here when I was three, so August 2020. Um, I started off in Queens, uh, lived there until about 2007, and then we moved out to Long Island, Elmont, um, which is where I am currently. Um, I wanted to be a doctor since I think around third grade. Um, a lot of that had to do with sort of cultural medicine. Um, you know, one example that I always give is 
Um, in South Asian culture, if you have a sore throat, you mix some turmeric and honey and you eat that and all of a sudden your, your sore throat goes away. So just um, being able to explore those, you know, cultural remedies, how they work, if they work, um, being able to bring them together with, you know, what we study as traditional Western medicine, um, really looking into those is really what piqued my curiosity in medicine. And then I pursued it and, you know, I've had a blast. Um, um, another thing that you should know about me is that I'm Muslim. Um, that's a really, really important part of my identity. Um, it shapes the way I go about my day. It shapes the way I plan my week. Um, I also participate, you know, um, volunteer in the local mosque, participate in the Muslim community um, at home and where I went to college. Um, I went to college at Cornell, um, Go Big Red, for anyone who's, else who's here from Cornell. Um, I loved it there. Um, the, just everything about it was absolutely beautiful. Um, I triple majored. I did biology, chemistry, and Near Eastern studies um, because I was interested in all three of those things, not to make my resume look impressive. I tell that to everyone. Um, I, just, I just loved the fields, that they, the classes that they offered there, and two of my favorite courses were actually in Near Eastern studies and chemistry. So I was really, really happy that I took those, that I took those on. Um, and then I took one gap year, uh, like Maddie said, um, if you take a gap year, um, you know, it's really, really helpful. Um, for those of you asking, I did all that in four years, so no extra time and no summers. Um, I just really, really liked the course that I took. Um, so, yeah, I took one gap year. It's really, really important if you feel you need it and if you really want that break. You know, I personally did not want to take a gap year because um, I still am interested in neurosurgery. And... Um, I know it's a seven-year residency and then fellowship after that and med school is also long. So I really wasn't looking to take a gap year, but um, I was really, you know, honest with myself and realized that I needed to because there were some things on my application and also just in my personal experiences that were lacking. Um, so we can talk more, a little more about that later. Um, but yeah, definitely if you feel that you want to take that gap year to really, you know, broaden your horizons and widen your perspectives, I totally recommend it. For my gap year, um, from 2019 to 2020, I worked at a dermatology clinic, um, outpatient private practice out in central Massachusetts for a year. Um, I really learned a lot there. I was a medical assistant, so everything from, you know, introducing patients or meeting patients for the first time, getting to talk to them, getting their initial um, history and everything, um, writing everything down, talking to the provider, working with him with, in biopsies, surgeries, all sorts of things. It was a really, really rewarding experience. Um, showed me that I definitely don't want to do dermatology, but um, it was definitely a really, really rewarding experience, uh, something that I really learned a lot from in terms of communicating with patients and thinking like a doctor. So that was really, really helpful. And of course, while I was there, I was working on my med medical applications and I'm so happy I got into Hofstra. I just completed my first year, I'm officially a second year now. Um, loved, every, loved every minute of it. Um, it's been great. The people here, the environment here, the faculty here, everyone's so awesome. Um, and of course, we'll, I'm sure we'll have time to advertise Zucker later. Um, and yeah, I'm currently also doing summer research. I'm also doing it in the neurosurgery department. I'm working with Dr. Michael Schilder out in North Shore. Um, and we're looking at using a genetic marker to determine um, if we can predict recurrence and later therapies and progression and overall survival of patients with meningiomas, which is a pretty common um, brain cancer. So working with him um, on that, really, really excited about it. Um, I've also gotten to shadow him a bunch of times, shadow him a couple of times, seeing a neurosurgery session, really cool. So yeah, hoping to continue that. And so I'm currently interested in neurosurgery, but I'm also interested in pathology. So this, this um, project is sort of a mix of both. Thank you. I know we have so many questions for you both, um, but we'll let you introduce yourself, Janos. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so I'm Janos Barbero. I'm Argentine-Hungarian. And uh, what drew me to medicine, I grew up in Hungary. And my father, um, he died young in his late 30s of cancer. And his surgeon uh, was the person that really inspired me to become a doctor. She took such good care of him, really fought for him, uh, did 11 operations on him and extended his prognosis. And he lived for two and a half years. And uh, that was such a gift to us, our entire family. 
Uh, at that point, I went to him to all the doctor's visits and so did my mom to interpret for him. And that was what convinced me that being a doctor was the, the best thing I could do with my life. Um, the year after he passed away, I had the opportunity to work in a neuroscience research lab in Hungary, the Palkovich lab. And there I was doing a retrograde tracing of um, uh, nuclei with tracer viruses in rats. And that was the experience that led me to want to become a physician scientist, which I'm in training for now. So uh, my mentor told me that to seriously pursue such a career, I needed to come to the United States. So that's what I did. I went, I came to the US for college. I went to the University of Washington. I took pre-med and I studied math and computer science uh, for my majors. Uh, I worked in three research labs in a bioinformatics lab for three years, uh, a craniofacial lab as a volunteer for two years. And I also co-created Folded, the protein folding video game uh, in my last two years there. Um, which is a really interesting game if you want to download it or read the paper. Uh, around this time, uh, when I was 15, I started working in software and uh, paying to the family rent to support my family, which was just my mother and me. Um, and after college, I applied to medical schools, uh, but I didn't get in as a foreign applicant. So I went to work in Silicon Valley to get my green card. And uh, I worked there, I had, uh, I often say I had 11 gap years because I worked there until I got my green card when I applied again. Uh, I worked at a company called Silver Spring Networks, uh, Facebook, and then most recently Google. And uh, during this time, I also volunteered for nine years as a medical interpreter, uh, interpreting for the local Latino community uh, who were medically underserved, often uninsured and uh, underinsured. So while I was at Google, I uh, took the MCAT, applied to the Zucker School of Medicine, and got into the MD-PhD program. And uh, I started that last year, and I just ended my first year this summer. I'm working in two research labs at the Feinstein Institute. One of them is working on EEGs, so um, extracranial with uh, headsets. And the other is going to be doing MRIs of uh, degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and par Parkinson's. So um, that's the story that led me here. Thank you. You guys all have such incredible stories. We are so, so lucky to have you. Um, I know we've already even had some questions. Um, I think it'll be easier probably if the questions are like directed at one of you um and then if another one wants to like add on something you can go ahead um Janos, while we're with you um can you talk a little bit more about md phd program because i know that's like different and how you applied for that versus if you were to just go down like the traditional md path yeah of course happy to so what happens the traditional structure is the four years of medical school are divided into two preclinical years and two clerkship years. Um, in an MD-PhD program, you would do your PhD, which is three or four years in the middle of those. So the first two years, I'm doing preclinical years with everyone else. And then I take step one, and then I work on my dissertation. Uh, once that's completed and defended, then I join back into the clerkship years. So it's about a seven to eight year uh, program length total. Got it. And what made you choose MD PhD over just doing research as an MD? Yeah, so it was definitely my childhood experiences. So my father's death is what drew me to medicine. And then at that point I thought I wanted to be a, a doctor and that never changed, but I also had the research experience in the Palkovich lab and he's actually the most published scientist in Hungary. And uh, he was a, a wonderful mentor to me. And at that point, I also saw that I wanted to work on medical research to not just practice, but hopefully be able to advance uh, patient care through research. And um, so the only, the only uh, training option that could give me both of those things was the MD PhD degree. And that's why I came to the United States. And that's why I always had the dream of becoming a physician scientist. 
Got it. Thank you for sharing that. I really would love to be a physician scientist too. I don't think I'm going to pursue the MD PhD route, um, but I think research is really important and I definitely want to continue doing it in addition to clinical. Um, just to like let you guys know, like I'm in my gap year before I'm currently applying to medical school. So you guys are like, I'm like googly eyed at you guys and <laughs> how far you've come. Um, it's amazing and intimidating, but also amazing. <laughs> um, Maddie, I saw there was a question for you up here. Um, yeah, uh, can you speak a little bit about how it works with matching and residency? I know you're applying to it now, but like, I'm sure you have a lot of information. Thank you, Giannis. We'll probably come back to you. I know we will, um, but thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, so I'm not a pro yet. Let me just give that disclaimer. Um, I'm just starting the process. But so basically the way it works is at some point during your med school process, you're going to want to decide on a specialty. Um, I was on the later end of things. So I saw someone just ask what has been your favorite rotation and why. And I'll kind of answer that as a way of getting into this. But I'm the type of person that I kind of love everything I do. Like I wanted to be a doctor for forever and there wasn't any way that I wasn't going to love every rotation because every rotation is medicine and this is all I wanted to do forever. Um, so that being said, it was kind of hard for me to settle on what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I had done neurosurgery research. And I knew I loved neurosurgery. I worked in an ER during my two gap years. I, lo I loved emergency medicine. Um, I had done a little bit of orthopedic surgery research in my gap year. I loved that. I kind of liked everything that I did. Um, and so Eventually, throughout the course of the year, I sort of decided, you know, the first thing you decide is surgery, not surgery. That's a big distinction. And then the other big distinction is kids or adults. Um, for me, it was hard to decide not to do surgery because I do love the OR. Um, but I knew that there were specialties in something like medicine where you can still be procedural, which is why I like cardiology and critical care. And so I decided that I wanted to do something more medicine based, but that ultimately would have the possibility of doing procedural things too. Um, and anyway, so the way that it works is at some point during the third year, you're going to decide what you want to do, um, earlier the better, but it doesn't really matter. I really didn't decide until like, you know, uh, maybe March or so. Um, and then once you decide, um, what you basically do is you, you know, pick a list of places that you're going to apply to sort of similar to med school, you know, similar criteria that you consider, you know, where you want to be ultimately, um, do you want to be at a research institution versus more of a community institution? Um, similar to med school, there's a personal statement. The only difference is that there are not supplement. So that's nice. Um, you have to take step one and step two. Step one will not be graded or yeah, graded for those who are gonna be doing it in the future, but for me it is. Um, so that counts sort of like the equivalent of the MCAT for uh, residency essentially. Um, and then what you do is you basically apply to X amount of places. That number is kind of dependent on what um, specialty you do. So something like medicine, because there's so many programs in the country, that number can be a little bit smaller, but for the neurosurgeries, you tend to apply to more programs because the programs are so small, two, two residents, four residents. Um, and then you get interviews sort of similar to med school, um, you're offered interviews. And then the way that the next part works is kind of the special, the match, if you guys have heard of that, where for every interview that you get, you ultimately rank them in order. And there's a special way that it's due. It's, it's due maybe, in, let's say, just say February 1st, where your, your match list is due, your rank list, it's called. Um, and you put all the institutions that you interviewed at in order of your preference. And at the same time, every institution puts all of their interviewees in an order as well. And then it goes through some computer algorithm that I have no idea how it works. Maybe Janos knows more about it because it's something technologic that goes way over my head. But um, ultimately you end up matching at one place. We get an envelope, we're all at school together. Although this past year they weren't together at school obviously, but you get an envelope and you open it up and it tells you where you are um, and where you're gonna end up for the next four years. So it's a, or however many years your residency is. So it's a crazy process um, and I'm excited but nervous for it, but um, mostly just kind of excited to, to the, get into the next phase of my life. So yeah, that's a little bit about how that works. I see a lot of questions based on that, but maybe I'll give someone else a chance to answer some questions and we can circle back or I don't know, whatever you think, Ashley. Yeah, I think we can circle back. Um, but thank you so much, Maddie. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of questions on that, I think, but, um, 
to give like that, like everyone a general understanding, I think is also good. And then we can circle back for more specifics. Um, Shazib, I, uh, I wanted you to start this, even though I think everyone else can say something about it. Cause none of you matriculated <laughs> directly. Bless you. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, none of you matriculated directly into medical school, but uh, Rushta asked, what are the greatest lessons each of you learned in your gap years or time before you actually went into medical school and why would you recommend it? I know you all said you really enjoyed that and it was helpful to fill like where you saw gaps in your application, no pun intended. Um, but uh, yeah, if you could just speak more about like how that year helped affirm you wanted to do medicine and also like any lessons you feel like you may have learned. Um, yeah, um, a lot of my friends and I tend to call it an enrichment year instead of gap years now. Um, because to, to sort of get away from that stigma that gap years waste time, they really don't. Um, yeah, they're really there for you to, um, you know, not just look good on your application. You know, a lot of people just get caught up in thinking about their application. It's really a, you know, a process, a way for you to grow um, and explore something you haven't done before. Like, I would never have thought to go into a, a, a work at a dermatology clinic in the center of Massachusetts. Um, so it really, ex one of the biggest things was it really exposed me to a um, new group of uh, just a sort of a new field, um, a new way of thinking about things. And it really helped me um, develop how I would talk to patients. Like I said, I was, you know, I was checking them in at the front, you know, um, getting them into their room, getting their initial history. Um, really being the point person for them and then giving that history back to the provider before they walked in and then sort of so that they had something to work with when they saw the patient, um, which is really a lot of what you do during your rotations. I think um, Maddie can speak more to that in third year, but um, that's what you do in third year. And that's also what we um, train. But that's also how we learn in Zucker as well um, in our very first two years that you sort of interview that patient, you have a dialogue with them, and then you come out, report back to the physician, and then you work from there. Um, so being able to learn those skills, being able to um, learn how to communicate, how to you know, empathize with patients was um, one of the biggest takeaways as a medical assistant in that clinic, so yeah. Yeah, that's great. Janos, uh, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I see you on mute. Yeah, sure. So during the my gap years, um, I was focused on getting a green card and supporting my family and paying off my debts. And uh, that was the greatest privilege for me um, was being able to support my family and make sure that, uh, that, that my mom was, was provided for. Um, and then it was, it was a really enriching experience for me because I grew a lot as a person and as a professional. Um, I had, uh, I had amazing experiences. I got to work on the database that all of Google runs on. Um, I captained a local Quidditch team and got into sports a lot. I traveled a lot. So, um, and, and during it all, uh, I was a volunteer for nine years at the free clinic in the Bay Area. So uh, I had nine years of patient interaction and seeing the problems of the underserved community, especially the Latino community, and uh, seeing the, the unique challenges faced by those who don't fit into the, the traditional medical model, who might rarely have access to medicine. Um, there's definitely uh, beliefs in traditional medicine. There's um, just language barriers. Uh, opportunity barriers, transportation barriers. Um, so those years made me uh, a better uh, person, a more empathetic person, uh, a more mature person, and um, probably a more organized and disciplined person as well. So tremendously enriching for me. I definitely agree with Shazade that not a minute of those years was wasted for me. I'm very happy that I got to. Thank you for sharing that with us. Maddie, do you wanna answer this one or? Yeah. Sure, and then I'll try to address some of the other questions that I saw that are somewhat related. So I absolutely agree. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's really just a personal decision. It works for some people. Some people just wanna go in straight. For me, as I said, I wanted both to enrich my application 
Um, I also like my, all my friends were moving to New York city. I wanted to have time with my friends before I started med school. If I'm being totally honest, like it wasn't even about my application. Like I just wanted to live like the rest of my friends were going to live, um, for, for a year or two, my parents, I'm, you know, I, I lived with my parents for two years. I saved money doing that. Um, so there was a lot of reasons that went beyond just, you know, enriching my application. Um, so I saw someone had asked somewhere, you know, do you, did you feel disadvantaged at all? I'm um, taking two years off. Um, in terms of like forgetting the information, I actually think it was probably the opposite for me. Um, I think I gained a tremendous amount of clinical information in my first two years, especially working as a scribe. So I worked as a scribe for Scribe America. Um, as some people said, I applied like directly on the website. Um, I think that I started school with probably more clinical information and knowledge than a lot of my classmates. Um, actually, the, a, a lot of faculty at our school are actually conducting um, a research study on the impact of scribe training prior to starting med school because they've kind of, at least I think, noticed a difference in how students come in. Um, at the same time, I saw this question asked a couple of times. A lot of information that you learn in college is not necessarily the same information that you learn in med school. I don't remember a single thing about physics and I don't think I've had to use it ever again. Um, you know, bio is obviously relevant. I think biochem is probably the most relevant. Um, learning about the biochem pathways are so relevant for like diabetes. Um, so in terms of like losing the information um, that you acquired in, in college, I really wouldn't worry about that as a reason not to take a gap year uh, because you'll gain tremendous experience in a variety of senses um, during your gap year that makes it all worth it. So, yeah. Thank you, Maddie, uh, super helpful. Um, and it's cool, you all have like such a diverse set of experiences and it's, and you all wanna pursue medicine. It's just goes to show you the field is like people from all over. Um, there was one I saw for Janos. Um, how has your experience in the technological field and background affected your research and your view on medicine? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I got into uh, I got into working in computing uh, originally to support myself through college uh, to pay the international student tuition and deal with the fact that I wasn't eligible for scholarships. But it became uh, a really enriching part of my life in all of the research labs. Um, except the craniofacial one, I worked uh, as a programmer, so I was able to contribute because um, it's, it's, it's very obvious now that there's no research that you, that you do um, almost in every research area, coding and programming and software engineering is involved. And I got to hone my skills at that uh, at this point for like 17 years or so. Fold It itself is a protein folding video game it's a fusion of biochemistry and computer science. And it was a joint project between a computer science lab and a biochemistry lab. So um, my, my coding background and my background in data analysis, which I did at various companies, is I think invaluable to what I, will, what I have done, am doing right now, and will do for the rest of my career when I'm working in research. So I think it's, it's invaluable if you happen to have some background in software engineering. Uh, definitely always mention it to the research labs where you're working and keep it in mind as something that can really uh, enrich the work that you're doing in research. That's great. Um, I'm jealous. I never took a computer science course in college and I feel like I regret that even though coding is not necessarily my thing. <laughs> I did like data analysis. The most I ever did was like SPSS statistics stuff, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was the most, but very cool that you can integrate that. Um, all right, let's see. Um, um, all right, I mean, this is a, a nice one. Uh, so I just saw a crazy TikTok, Jennifer said, I just saw a crazy TikTok about gender wage gaps among physicians. There's no specialty with equal pay between men and women. Uh, the lowest wage gap is 45K. For the aspiring female medical students and practicing female healthcare professionals, so I'm sure we'll touch on this in the later lectures too, is there anything being done within the institutions and hospitals to combat this? Um, obviously anyone can answer this, but Maddie, I feel like <laughs> it 
as a female as a woman it's probably more a question for you um if you want to answer take a stab at it to be honest i think this is probably a better question for later just because at this point, I don't, you know, I don't know too much about what goes on on that end. I'm still worried about, you know, eventually paying off my own than <laughs> the salary that I'll be making. But, you know, unfortunately in the society that we live in, we're still kind of transitioning out of the era of unequal pay, unequal rights. Um, and it's not just medicine where we see it, you know, we see it in everything. Um, but unfortunately, obviously it is prevalent in, in medicine. And, you know, it's also hard because there are a lot of specialties that are very male predominant specialties. And I feel like that kind of just serves to um, kind of propagate this issue a little bit. Um, I don't really have the answer of wh what's being done on the backside of things. As I said, I think that, you know, talk, talking to Dr. Rosen and Dr. Nerula, two of the, you know, speakers that are going to be speaking who are really powerhouses, um, they might have a better answer. But, you know, it's something to consider. And it's something that, you know, obviously I thought of before applying, and I think it's something a lot of people think about before applying, but it's something that hopefully we're kind of going in the right direction of. And it's something that if, you know, you're passionate about changing that, you know, you have the opportunity to, to do so. I think that, you know, it, it just means that we just kind of have to go into this with the knowledge that there is some inequality, but it also means that we have an opportunity and a place to fight against it. And I think that, you know, I'm someone in, in medicine who I, I do a lot of leadership related things in med school right now. I'm the president of my class and I was the head of a couple of clubs. Um, I'm on a lot of committees and that's something that I wanna continue doing throughout my residency and I'm attending as well. And I think that fighting for equality for women is definitely gonna be up on my list of things to do, but it's a long process and it requires awareness. So I'm really glad that whoever asked that you're aware that this is an issue. Um, and then it requires taking that awareness and make turning it into action. So I think that, you know, we'll all work together and hopefully down the line when you guys are attending is that that gap will narrow if not um, completely erased. So I know that's not the best answer, but maybe um, Dr. Nerula and Dr. Rosen can give a little bit more insight into like what's actually being done on the on the backside of things. Thank you for sharing with us, Maddie. Um, yeah, I uh, think one of the best ways you can like fight for women in medicine is to be a woman in medicine. <laughs> Um, and do like a really great job. Um, are we frozen a little bit? Is this me? Okay, I think the lag is over. Yes, okay. My internet connection is unstable. I'm sorry, guys. Um, okay, I think we're, we're, we're moving. Um, Shazim, I, uh, I think this is a really important question, um, especially because you said you are really passionate about being Muslim and in medicine. And someone was asking, first of all, uh, you got a bunch of thank yous for representing the community. So um, again, thank you for that. And uh, Sina asked, how do you navigate being a Muslim in medicine with the existing stereotypes? Has it been difficult? So it's like a very serious question, but I think you can really help a lot of people with the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so first, um, it's a little hard because there are only, in our, in our class, like there are only three Muslim students. Um, so definitely the representation is obviously not as much as we would like it to be, right? Um, so we're, you know, greatly overshadowed or um, outnumbered by people from other religions, which is not to say anything bad about them, but also um, it's sometimes difficult to get a class or, you know, um, administrations moving when there's only three students who might benefit um, per class. So that's definitely one of the biggest challenges that I face. So I'm currently president of the Muslim Medical Student Association at Cornell, um, Cornell at Zucker. Um, so, um, you know, when I, I think recently I sent out a poll for like, you know, just trying to see what the population was that I was serving and, um, you know, what sort of things they were looking for. I got maybe 10 responses, you know, out of the entire four years. So I think that's the biggest problem is um, representation. And sometimes those, you know, even if they're Muslim, they're at different stages, whether they're practicing or not. So really being able to come up with a sort of unified um, message if this is what we're looking for, I think that's been the biggest challenge. Um, but, and in but in terms of discrimination, um, you know, which is obviously um, a really, really serious thing to consider. Um, I personally haven't seen anything of that sort um, from, you know, the people I've worked with, the clinics I've gone to, um, the administration um, at Zucker, everyone's very, very helpful. Everyone's very, very open. Um, the dean 
um, emails every now and then when there's a holiday coming up, hey, we want to send out this um, sort of memo about, you know, a holiday coming up. Does this look good? Is this okay? Is it, um, you know, is, does it line up with what you, how you think of the holiday, which is um, really important. It means a lot. Um, yeah, and then the one other place that it might, that might um, you know, I wish there was a little more was um, in terms of the injustices that happen in the world. Um, sometimes there's a lot of political um, implications, um, sociopolitical, geographic. Um, there's a lot of, you know, tension out in the world. And um, sometimes there's there are things that are said or that aren't said that we wish were said or weren't said, um, respectively. Um, so just being aware of that and sort of raising awareness, I think, is the um, most important thing. Um, one thing I did this past month um, after, I think, um, I think it was a month ago, maybe, um, I we did a movie screening. Um, me and another club, the South Asian Club at um, Hofstra, did a movie screening for a really, really awesome movie called My Name is Khan, um, which is a really, for those of you, anyone who's seen it, um, I'm sure you liked it. For those of you who haven't seen it, I would highly, highly recommend it. If you're taking a break, um, find that movie. It's actually free with ads on YouTube. Um, it's about a, an Indian Muslim man's journey as an immigrant and then through um, growing up in America or um, making a life in America um, pre and post 9-11. Obviously 9-11 is a big turning point for you know Islamophobia and South Asian um, discrimination in this country. Um, so you know that that was that's a really powerful movie and um, you know being able to show that movie to the Zucker community was really really important for me um, in being able to sort of highlight the challenges we face and um, you know what sort of things we go through and being able to make, raise awareness for that. So that was really good. And the movie is My Name is Khan, K-H-A-N. Thank you for sharing that. Um, really powerful. Uh, just quickly, like a follow up with that. You feel like Zucker School of Medicine has like been really good about like affording you the opportunity to like share um, your like religion, practice it in your own way, share it with the community and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I personally, I'm an, I'm not one to like sort of you know make a big deal about it. I sort of just do my own thing and. You know, I, I'm, I like to, you know, um, do my religious stuff in private. Um, so I'm so, but but if I were to, you know, advertise it and talk about it, like they're very receptive to it. Like I recently asked for a prayer space um, for this. You know, even if there are a few students who pray on campus, um, being able to have that space, um, I just sort of raised that talk, and they were, you know, really open to it. Um, the dean is very, very. Um, he does a, he does lectures, and you know, we, I'm free to go up to him. I did once and asked him a question about, you know. Muslim representation. He was really, really open to that discussion. So um, I think the, recept the rec receptivity is there. I think the problem, at least in Zucker, is just there aren't enough people to really, you know, get something that we want done. If, if there's, there isn't really like um, what's something specific that, you know, people are like, yes, this is what we should do. Um, one thing that is, is um, sort of linking up with Muslim practitioners in the Northwell system. I and mean, that's currently what I'm working on. That's something I'm going to try to do this coming, upcoming year. Nice. That's great. Um, so uh, we have like some younger, some younger kids here too. So there's a mix of like, how did you decide what major you wanted to be an undergrad to like, what about residency? So there is like a big range. Um, but let's see. Um, so we'll kind of throw these two uh, together. What did you find uh, made you successful in medical school, um, both with like being able to kind of balance your studying with your personal life and then also with studying like what was what were some of like the great methods you learned for studying? And I think all three of you can hopefully answer this, um, but Shazay, if you can start. Could you just repeat the questions again? Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I was just saying, uh, what essentially what study strategies and what means of like joining clubs helped you to both like be most successful and also have the best balance of like being a great medical student but also like getting to be a person as well um is that good okay yeah so um for studying i really use a lot of 
um, videos and I'm really a traditional textbook guy. So I love um, pulling up a PDF of a textbook and just flipping through that or getting a textbook from a library and reading through that. Um, I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I really enjoy doing that. Um, so yeah, that's how I did most of my studying this first year of med school. Um, lots of videos and lots of textbook reading. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that, that just works for me. Um, also, I love, I'm a very visual person. So Zucker has these really awesome rooms where they're like floor to ceiling boards on two sides of the wall. So I just love writing stuff um, on boards. Um, if I don't have a board, I'll write it on a piece of paper. Um, so I'm very visual. I like to write things out and then take pictures or save them somehow. Um, so that's how I study. That's how I feel the information sticks best in my head. Um, also, the group study at Zucker and I'm sure at other med schools is really awesome. I would definitely recommend that you find, you know, a group of three or four, maybe five students who you get along with, you can be friends with and um, study together. Um, it's a really, really awesome way for you to you to fill in someone else's gaps, someone else to fill in your gaps and really um, make sure you're synthesizing knowledge and reconciling it and growing together. Um, because med medicine is really, you know, at the end of the day, it should be a collaborative field. Um, so being able to work with other um, future doctors and colleagues is definitely important. So I would definitely recommend that. And in terms of free time, um, so I don't know, you know, speaking from Zucker's experience, the experience I've had at Zucker, we have several clubs that are very, very low commitment. Um, obviously, they recognize that your first role is, at a med, is as a med student. So you really participate as much as you can and want to. Um, so my favorite statistic is we have 75 clubs and 200 students who are consistently on campus. So obviously there's a lot of you know, space and um, time for people who want to participate in these clubs to participate in these clubs. Um, I am part of the New and Prospective Students Committee at Zucker. And like I said, I'm president of the Muslim Medical Student Association. Um, so though being involved with those, those um, programs is just, you know, I really like doing that. Um, so new and prospective students orientations coming up for the Zucker students of the next class. Um, so I'm involved in planning that, organizing events for them, making sure they're, you know, feeling welcomed and, um, you know, heard in the, and supported as they enter the, um, as they enter the Zucker community. So that's really awesome. Um, I've always loved doing that, teaching, supporting, you know, acting like a big brother. Um, that's really been my, been my thing since, um, since college. So I really love doing that. Um, and then, yeah, Muslim Medical Student Association. And then there are so, so many other clubs uh, at Zucker. There's recreational clubs like gaming and running. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. I'll let someone else go now. But yeah, there's, there's so many clubs and so much time for you to participate in, in Zucker. So yeah. I think Maddie will have uh, the best answer to this question because she has the most experience among us. But I'll share my first year student perspective uh, and but wait for Maddie's definitive answer. So um, I, I, f I felt very relaxed through medical school. It, I'm honestly having the best time of my life. Um, and I, I, I seem to have a lot of free time. Like I walk my dog three times a day. I take him to dog parks. I always get my eight hours of sleep. Uh, I hang out with my partner on the weekends. Um, I often take weekend trips. I think that the important thing is that you're going to be bombarded by a lot of resources and a lot of study materials and study tips. And um, you really have to evaluate what works for you. And you have, to, you have to prioritize your time in the sense that if something isn't working, isn't making you learn the material better, be better for exams, then don't do it cut it out and find something different. If you're just staring at a study material or video and it's not entering your head, then stand up and reevaluate how you could learn that material better. For me, a lot of experimentation led to Anki and um, I study that for maybe three, four hours a day. And that is the bulk of what I do. I have a study schedule all the way down to step one, which is in March of next year. And uh, I've recently started doing question banks as well. Um, I think the most important thing is medicine will force you to become more intentional with your time. And so embrace that. You will, you will become better at managing your time. And this should free you up to have a balanced life. 
but again, Maddie will have the definitive perspective. Here. Everything you guys said is perfect. I don't want to. I don't want to talk too long. We can get go to some other questions, but I totally agree. I think the most important thing, and I've you know I've done a couple panels now for the uh, classes younger than me, um, and I say the same thing in every panel, which is that you have to find what's best for you. There's going to be people that are going to be throwing tons and tons of different you know study methodologies out to you, and you just have to do what works for you without being stressed out by what everyone else is doing. And I think that that makes the difference. You know, when I started med school. Um, for the first two years, the preclinical years, I did exactly what I did during college. I typed up study guides based on the lectures. I would print them out before my exams and highlight and take notes on them. That was exactly what I did. I was comfortable with what I did in college. It worked. I passed all my exams, like fine. Um, but then when it came time to, for studying for step one and during clinical years, I completely transitioned and now I swear by Anki. Um, and that's because I just explored it. I, tr I tried different things. It wasn't that it wasn't working for me, but I just wanted to try something new. Um, so it's about finding what works for you. The first couple of you know weeks of med school could totally be rough and that's okay. I remember having the same conversations with everyone being like, oh my God, do I use Notability or EndNote? Do I use Microsoft Word or do I handwrite everything? Um, so basic, you know, it's just about finding what works for you. Um, in terms of the work-life balance, I totally agree with Janos. You know, it, you really can find work-life balance. Um, you know, you do have to go into it with the knowledge that you are um, going into a field that demands a lot of you and perhaps you might not have, have as much free time as you previously had or that, you know, those around you might have. Um, but if you love what you're doing and hopefully if you apply into it, you know, it means that you love it, you know, all that extra time will be worth it. That being said, I do have a tremendous amount of free time. Um, you know, I work very hard during the week, you know, I come home from school and I do work, you know, until, you know, an hour before I go to bed when I then decide to watch a TV show. Um, but on the weekends during my first two years, I always gave myself a day off, always. Um, is usually I took Friday night off. I would go and, you know, I, I would drive into the city because um, Hofstra's out on Long Island, drive into New York City. I would get dinner with my friends who I hadn't seen or my family. And then I would take all Saturday off. Um, and that was fine. That was doable. Um, and, you know, it's about, again, it's about prioritizing things that are important to you. You're not going to be a good student if your anxiety level is up here and your mental health is down here. Um, and so prioritizing those things will end up, you know, making you the best type of student that you can be. And that's kind of the biggest lesson that I, I have learned over the course of these four years. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, every one of you. I'm trying to, so right now we have a little less than like 10 minutes left. Um, which is great. I knew we would be able to just go with the Q and A, and it would there would be plenty of questions. Um, I'm trying to see like some of them are like more technical, like about the MCAT and stuff like that. Um, but I always like asking like the like challenges and advice ones because I think that those are um, really really helpful. Uh, here's a cool one. This can allow you guys to plug Zucker School of Medicine. Um, what do you like most about Hofstra? Um, so that'll be a good one. Oh God, I can say so many things. I love this school. This is, this is not, I'm not being paid. Um, this is totally for me, but uh, there's so many things that I love. I think the best thing for me um, is the community. So we have a small class or a class of a hundred, which is pretty small for med school. I think that's almost on like the lower end of things. Um, every single one of our classes is mandatory, which sounds really intimidating. Some people don't like the, the idea of that, and that's okay. It's important to know those types of things. Um, but that means that every student is on campus or is on Zoom together um, throughout the course of the day. And there's nothing that brings people closer together than literally being together. Um, my class is incredibly close. I've known every single person well from the first year. I know every person in my class. Um, we're an incredibly close group of people. Um, the faculty are extremely close with us as well. Um, you know, we have in-house faculty who literally have offices and are there 24 seven. And when I say they have an open door policy, I literally mean that their doors are actually wide open every minute of every single day. Um, there's just a really positive culture and great relationships. I just, I feel like the, the faculty are really invested in us doing well. Um, they're not there to challenge us. They don't want us to do poorly. There's even some faculty that thinks that we shouldn't even have grades altogether on exams, let alone pass fail. Um, they just want us to learn. Um, and yeah, I just, there's not a competitive atmosphere. I think 
Part of that is because we're such a small closed class and we have these small group learning activities. Part of it is because, you know, we're past fail, which is not special to Hofstra, it's now becoming more common. Um, but there's just so many different things that contribute to um, our school having a really close community, both within the students as well as the faculty. And I think that that's one of my, one of my favorite parts about it. Yeah, um, I can continue. Um, yeah, that was going to be my answer. Um, the community here and the dedicated faculty, um, but it goes beyond just students and faculty. I'll say this little thing before I move on to my real answer. Um, everyone in the building is looking out for you. Um, the staff, the, um, the student affairs office, the um, everyone in the building is trying to make sure you do the best you can. Um, so students are working together, faculty is working with you, like some of them will hand out their phone numbers, like call me, text me anytime you want, I'll answer any questions you have. Um, all the people in the offices are here to help you. Um, even the security guards know everyone's name. So there's you know, a huge sense of community and everyone knows each other and everyone's in it together. Um, so that's really awesome. Uh, my real answer is um, the network that um, Hofstra is a part of. So we're a part of um, Northwell, as you guys know, um, this is a Northwell, um, I guess, program. Um, so it's one of the largest, if not the largest um, health system in the Northeast. Um, where see, we see patients all the way from um, New York in Manhattan, all the way out to, you know, the other end of Long Island, um, South Side, the North Shore, South Shore, everywhere. Um, so there's a huge diversity of patients, a huge diversity of physicians and um, practitioners um, that you can see, um, also that you can work with. Um, obviously, some um, practitioners are here with us today. Um, so these are people you can reach out to and are more than happy for you to reach out to them and talk to them and ask them for advice and ask to see a rotation, ask to see a surgery, ask to see a procedure. Um, so they're so willing to take you on as mentees and sort of guide you through the process, teach you, um, help you, assist you as you, you know, go through your med school journey because they are so invested in us as students or um, in you guys when you become students. Um, so that's um, really, really helpful. Um, I personally reached out to, you know, practitioners in the Northwell system and they were so eager to take me on and um, that sense of support is really, really important and really awesome. So that's um, one of the big things as well. Yeah, so um, uh, Hofstra, I love, um, in addition to what the other panelists mentioned, I love the curriculum. We were trained as EMTs. Um, we get to do ultrasound, physical diagnosis, um, clinical learning and every week we are in either the hospital or the clinic, which is I think a really unique experience and is what I love the best about the curriculum. And uh, a couple of you asked about how to find shadowing opportunities. What I did in college, I talked to my pre-med professors and I looked for the ads posted on walls that were looking for research, uh, for students to work in research labs and I talked to those PIs and that's how I was able to get my shadowing opportunities. Thanks. Thank you guys. Um, 